Hi everybody, Jim Crimmins here from Small Business Financials. Thanks for being with me today. We're going to talk a little bit about the IRS and how they go about audits. Uh, when I was doing the research on putting this together, I found it very interesting. I hope you will too. We've got to get a couple of housekeeping things out of the way and then we'll be ready to go. The big question is, what is an audit? If the IRS determines that you have made an error somewhere on your return, you can be assessed additional taxes, interest, and often penalties. Congress has given the IRS wide powers to examine your financial papers and the records. IRS auditors can even ask other people about your financial affairs to determine if you're playing it straight with the IRS. Sometimes the IRS reviews your tax return and determines that you made errors but does not audit you. Instead, they'll bill you for the additional amount the service believes you owe. And we'll go into that in more detail momentarily. <clears throat> While you stand a chance of being formally audited in any one year is the chance of you being audited in any one year is only between 1 and 2 percent. The odds of a taxpayer being audited during their lifetime are closer to 50 percent. As your income increases, so does the likelihood of an audit. The likelihood also goes way up if you're self-employed. And with the IRS, you're guilty until you can prove that you're innocent, just the opposite of our judicial system. The IRS wins well over 80% of all audits that are challenged, mostly because people can't verify what's on their tax returns. Remember in our previous webinars, we've talked about document, document, document. And this is definitely one of the reasons I am shocked when I read the tax court cases, how many people try to make deductions without any proper documentation. And, and they're going to lose every time, but they keep fighting it. I don't understand it. IRS auditors will admit that the biggest reason for the lack of backup is poor record keeping, not dishonesty. Do you need to be a tax attorney? Well, no matter how much you study it, you're never going to understand the tax laws. Few people do. Tax professionals do to a certain degree. LLMs, which is a tax attorney, and CPAs and enrolled agents with their years of special training and experience, they're the only ones that even come close. Tax law is so voluminous and compels that most auditors themselves that work for the IRS don't know it very well either. And I can tell you a story about the first person we ever had audited and what we went through with them. A minority of taxpayers with highly complex taxes will face specially trained auditors that do know what they're doing. But the qualifications for being hired on at the IRS are uh, very lax so that they can actually fill their jobs. Most of the people don't have to have more than two years of accounting, and some of them don't even have that. My personal thoughts is that you, the less you yourself actually talk during an audit, the better off you're going to be. Form 3115 used by small business to identify their method of deducting capital equipment. 8962, 8965, and 8941 all have to do with the Affordable Care Act. 
One election is a de minimis election for purchase property. The other is safe harbor election for repairs and maintenance. Form 1095A is the one you will receive from the health exchange if you have insurance through it. If you file your return prior to April 15th, the time clock does not start running until April 15th itself. However, if you were audited within the last two years and the IRS found no more than $1,000 or so in adjustments or issued no change report at all, you should not be audited again for a period of time. If you are, call the IRS and ask that the audit be canceled. In three situations, the IRS has more than three years to complete an audit of your tax return. And remember, this timing as we go through these audits is very important. So the key here is the IRS only has three years, normally only has three years from the date that you uh, filed your tax return which means if you filed it before April 15th, it starts on April 15th. And if you wait like I do until October 15th, it doesn't start until October 15th. If uh, the three situations that the IRS has more than three years for, if the service believes you understated your income by 25% or more, it's got six years to complete the audit. If at any time they believe you filed a fraudulent return, there's no time limit at all on auditing that return. And if you did not file a tax return, the IRS has forever to audit you. However, the three or six years will begin when the return is posted when you finally uh, catch up your tax returns. Remember that the IRS not only has three years to begin an audit on your return, but must complete the audit within three years of the filing date. This is the biggest question that I get when I'm talking to people. Why was I even selected for an audit? Well, you're never going to know for certain why. But some of the reasons you might, if you didn't file a tax return, the IRS can calculate your tax liability, sending you a bill, and this in effect return, uh, fills out the return for you. Following the completion of this, they will mail an audit report to you to your last known address. You can then sign it or accept what they have fictionalized or if you didn't like the return that they have made, you can file your own return, which is the best course of action if you have the documentation that goes with it. Number two, computer selects about two-thirds of all audit. Each year your tax return data is sent to the IRS National Computer Center. There it is analyzed by a computer program called the Discriminant Function. Great name, huh? Discriminant Function. Your return will receive a numerical DIF rating. The higher the score, the more audit potential the return has. This formula, as is most things with the IRS, is super secret. The third reason you might be selected for an audit, a market segment specialization program. Try to say that quickly three times. This is the wave of the future. Each audit focuses on a special industry or group of taxpayers who the IRS believes may not be in full compliance with the tax laws. There are several other reasons. Could be a local project of the IRS, a national project, previous audits that you've been through, any criminal activity, amended tax returns. And, and this is something that I'm asked a lot is, hey, I just found something that would get me a $50 more 
uh, refund from the IRS. Shall I file a, an amended tax return and take advantage of that? And my answer always is, although it's, it's just Crimmins one and one, is that you can, but it's my understanding that more people are audited after they file an amendment than at any other time. You can be audited because of a whistleblower or because of the geography you live in. The audit rate's 150% higher than the national average in Nevada. But it's 150% lower in Wisconsin. Go figure. What are your goals in an audit? Except the eight to one odds that your audit will end up with a tax bill. That's the first thing you need to realize. So your aim is going to be for damage control. If the IRS bills you for less than $1,000 at the end of the audit, consider yourself victorious. The auditor can examine any open tax year if such an examination is likely to be fruitful. Open tax years are those for tax returns filed within the past three years. But they have to tell you what they would like you to bring to the audit and what they want to discuss. But So never show the auditor anything other than what they, are, what they have asked for. Never, never, never. If you file your return during an office or field audit, the audit is likely to be expanded to include that return. So the last thing up there, do not file a tax return while you're under audit. Just keep filing extensions. And if you get to October and the audit's not complete, go ahead and pay any tax bill you have. But I recommend not filing the return at that time. Now, a bit of levity. An IRS agent, the guy that he was auditing, and the tax counsel have had a good first morning of an audit. And all agree to go, go to lunch together. On their way to lunch, they file an an, find an antique oil lamp. They rub it, and a genie comes out. The genie says, I'll give each one of you just one wish. Me first, says the auditee. He says, I want to be in the Bahamas driving a speedboat without a care in the world away from this audit. Poof, he's gone. Me next, says the tax pro. I want to be in Hawaii relaxing on the beach with my masseuse, an endless supply of pina coladas and the love of my life beside me away from all of my clients who have such complex problems with the IRS. Poof. She's gone. Okay, you're up, said the genie to the IRS auditor. The auditor said, I want those two people back in the audit room after lunch. The moral of this story, don't open your mouth during an IRS audit until the auditor has said all he or she needs or wants to say. What are your rights during an audit? If an IRS employee is not professional, prompt, and courteous, you have a right to speak to a supervisor. Your representative must be designated to practice before the IRS and have a written power of attorney from you. With a few exceptions, Auditors cannot force you personally to appear or even speak to you if you hire a representative. If you go in and have a tape recorder, this may cause the auditor to work even harder to try to find something. For this reason, most tax professionals will not um, try to record an audit. My advice is you don't do that either. As I said before, if you were audited within the past two years and the IRS made adjustments of $1,000 or less, you cannot be audited again for the same items. 
If you are complained to the IRS appointment clerk or the auditor, one exception to that is you can be audited again for self-employment taxes, small business items such as vehicle and entertainment expenses, equipment purchase, and employee benefits. The audit report you're going to receive after your examination is typically vague, written with a lot of IRS ease, C, and if you do not understand something, you have the right to ask questions until you do understand it. Self -incrimin and the lack of self-incrimination is a constitutionally dictated right. There are several different types of audit. The first one we want to discuss is what's called a correspondence audit. It's not very used very much anymore, but still is to some degree. In this audit, you receive a letter from the IRS. You need to read the notice carefully so that you understand exactly what the IRS is asking you to verify. Comb your records and find the documentation to justify any difference between what you think and what the IRS thinks or what the IRS is asking for. Scan it in your computer and send it back to the IRS. Do never send originals back to them. If you're scanning it, you've got the record on your computer. If you're sending a snail mail, you certified return receipt requested. You can re uh, request a transfer for a face-to-face -face meeting at your local IRS district office if you would rather have that rather than doing it through the mail. Many correspondence audits transferred to the local offices are closed with no adjustments. The next type of audit is the Service Center Automated Adjustment Notice. These are not formal audits. However, your tax return is still at risk of being audited. This is generally sending you a note to correct a math error or similar problem on your return. It's used when the IRS feels if you did not meet a filing deadline or tax payment deadline. The, it'll be used when the IRS believes you did not pay a tax bill on time, or when the IRS has found a mismatch between two data sources, unreported IRS distributions, the income on your return does not match a 1099 on file. Years ago, I had a client down in Tucson uh, who taught uh, trading. And he called me and said, Jim, I just got a bill from the IRS for a little over a million dollars. What is it? Well, we looked at it for a while, and we finally figured out that what the IRS had done on his 1099, it only showed the sale of the stock that he personally sold. They never calculated the cost of that stock. So he was fine, but it did take a few years off his life, and it did cost us some time to try to figure out what had gone on. So that's one of the ways that your IRA or your uh, 1099 may not match. Mortgage interest deduction doesn't match your lender's report on the 1098 form that they've sent in or wages or withhold reporting on your return doesn't match the W-2 that your employer sent in. Now, if you get an automated adjustment notice from the IRS, take some time with it. A common IRS mistake is not finding an income item that was reported elsewhere on your tax return particularly if you're in the rental real estate office or business. It's estimated that the IRS collects over $7 billion a year, billion dollars a year to which it's not entitled because of these adjustment notices, and people just go ahead and accept them. 
Now, if you need to contest anything, call the IRS and ask for a full explanation of the automated adjustments. Always write down the time and date of your call and ask the IRS rep for his name and his badge number. Then you have 60 days to contest it in writing. That's 60 days from the date on the notice. If you don't do it in that time period, the adjustment becomes final. Object in all cases, even if the IRS rep agreed over the phone to correct the automated adjustment. That's very important. Whatever the IRS rep tells you on the phone is fine, but that's one thing. Go ahead and send your documentation in, certified mail, return request, re return receipt requested, even though they said they're going to correct it. If the IRS doesn't agree to change your request, it'll send you a notice of deficiency. If you want to contest this, you must file a petition in U.S. Tax Court within 90 days of the date on the letter. I know tax court sounds big and, and that you need a lot of experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not true. It only costs about 60 bucks to file in tax court. You've got 90 days to do it. And generally, you don't have to go anywhere. It can all be handled over the phone. The next type audit is an office audit. An office audit is also the type in which you're likely to emerge with the least amount of damage. IRS statistics show that office audits result in an additional tax in penalties averaging only about $2,000. The office audit is announced by a computer-generated form letter. It sets a time and a date for the meeting, generally to be held at the IRS office, or request that you call and make an appointment. The letter states the year or years that you're being audited about and may specify type of documentation that you're being asked to bring. You may want to get the audit behind you, but consider taking a real slow approach. Remember, we said the IRS only has three years from the date you filed your return to get the audit completed. The more time you can take, the quicker that three years might show up. Thought my thoughts on slowing an audit down, don't call back right away. Wait a couple of weeks. Schedule your office audit for as far in the distance as you can. Never underestimate the length of time it's going to take you to get the records or that the, audit, that the auditor is asking for. If possible, schedule your appointment late on a Friday. And also, if you can schedule it on a Friday before a three-day holiday, it'll even be better. Schedule it as late in the month as possible. Two or three days before your audit appointment, call and try to reschedule it. The service will generally grant you one or two postponements for almost any reason at all. To prepare for the audit, IRS Form 4700 and 4700 Supplement, these two forms function as the internal checklist for auditors. They highlight the areas of the inquiry you can expect. If any item on these forms gives you real heartburn, you may want to immediately seek out the service of a tax pro to represent you. Many auditors are young and some from different cultures. They may have limited English skills and typically have little experience in the business world. This may present you with a challenge, especially if you're self-employed. 
office auditors are usually not the cream of the IRS examination division. The 10 top office audit issues are, number one, income, number two, living expenses. As an example, if you reported income near the poverty level, the auditor may want to know how you live. You may want to come out to your house and see what size house you live in. Number three is dependent exemptions. People take more exemptions, one for their dog, one for their cat. Theft and casualty losses. Charitable, charitable deductions. The IRS regulations require that you document all charitable deductions that exceed $250. If you file unre unreimbursed employee benefits, could be a red flag. Itemized deductions, previous audits, and number nine is other tax returns. You can safely ignore the audit notice where it says to bring other tax returns. Field audits are the next type audit. This letter that you receive will either suggest a time and a date for the audit or will ask you to call and arrange it. Caution, you're now in the big leagues. Local senior IRS personnel decide who gets subjected to a field audit. Typically self-employed taxpayers, real estate investors with more than one rental, earners of more than a hundred grand and people with complex tax returns are selected. Revenue agents in this case are the IRS elite auditors. They have a college degree in accounting or at least 30 semester hours of college level accounting. They are detectives looking for clues. The field audit tax bills are on average eight times higher than office audit tax bills. If you get a call from someone saying they're from the IRS and is auditing you, what should you do? Ask them to send it in writing and do not discuss anything with them. Refuse to talk to the agent until you have an audit notice in writing. How do you make the audit? painless. Well, the best way is never to have an audit. But if you have a good documentation system or you use a bookkeeping service for your bills, etc., etc., as, as long as the tax return matches what the bookkeeper has, you shouldn't have any problem at all with an audit. But my thought is, if you get a notice for an audit and you think there's a possibility because of something you know and I don't, that it could cost you more than $1,000, you may want to hire a tax pro. Before you call, to schedule your appointment. Give some good thought to where and when you want to have the audit take place. The revenue agent will go wherever you have your financial records. As I discussed before, give yourself plenty of time to prepare by asking for at least a month, preferably two. Then the next thing you need to consider is whether you feel comfortable hand handling the audit yourself or whether you want to hire a tax pro. If you want the tax pro, have him or her call the IRS to schedule the audit. Most tax professionals will recommend that you avoid having the audit at your home or office, even if you feel you have nothing to hide. Under the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, small business owners have the right to refuse to have a field audit at the business premise if it would cause minor disruption in their business. If you can show where this is the case, ask that the audit take place at the IRS office. Or if you've hired a tax pro, 
at their office. The top six field audit issues are unreported business income, which would uh, result in a net worth issue, could be an expenditure issue or a bank deposit issue, or your cost of goods sold. The second reason is verification of business expenses. Do you have documentation of each? Are you running some personal expenses through your business? The IRS is especially interested in auto, travel, and entertainment deductions. The third reason is sales of assets and the tax basis that you claimed. Four is living beyond one's means. Five is rental real estate. And six is the classification of your workers as employees or independent contractors. If you have classified employees as independent contractors and the IRS does not deem that they meet that category, and they're very, very tough on this, you'll receive a bill for unreported payroll taxes, interest, and penalty. You're probably, in that case, going to owe money to the state also. Going on with the field audit, give yourself plenty of time to arrive punctually and start off on the right foot. The clothes you wear that day should be in keeping with your job and station in life. You can expect your audit to last from one to four hours. The last audit that I was personally involved with, we had documentation so well done and laid out for the auditor, it took him less than 15 minutes to decide to leave. Who should attend the audit? Well, you can attend by yourself, but I've always felt that you need to send a representative that knows what they're doing. If you decide to go that way, you've got to sign an IRS form waiving your rights to privacy to allow the other people to be uh, present. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is talking too much. They think the more they talk, the better the IRS agent's going to like them. Remember, that IRS agent's never going to be your friend. Never. So all the talking in the world you're trying to do is not going to remedy anything. What should you bring to the audit? Well, when you receive your notice, you probably have received a list of documents. Don't bring anything else. The auditor asks you about an item you did not bring, indicates you did not come prepared to discuss them. Always avoid giving original documents to the IRS. If requested, take with you only the canceled checks and receipts related to the area involved. Don't let the auditor rummage through your other checks not related to the tax return. If your business has no records at all, you may be subject to a fine, and the auditor can make up records by pure guesswork. This forces you to come up with records or accept their figures. An empress with no children decided to hold a, comp hold a competition to determine who would succeed her when she died. She summoned all of the children in the city to her palace and gave each one a seed. Plant the seed, care for it, and one year from now bring back the flower that grows from it. Whoever brings me the most beautiful flower will be the next empress. One young girl planted her seed in a pot and watered it every day, but nothing ever grew. At the end of the year, she was devastated. But on the appointed day, she set out for expectation of the flowers. She picked up her pot and carried it to the palace. All of the other children bought colorful, vibrant flowers, but the empress only glanced at them. She walked straight to the young girl and smiled. 
All of the seeds I gave you had been boiled and were dead. Only you were honest enough to bring back the original seed I gave you. You will be a just and wise empress. The moral of this story is if you're audited, tell the truth, even when it seems easier not to. How should you behave? Mum's the word. Audits are inherently stressful. People under stress often talk too much. The IRS knows this, so auditors are trained to listen and create opportunities for you to talk. If you know yourself and understand that you're uncomfortable with prolonged periods of silence, you probably should think twice about attending this. Hire somebody else to attend it for you. You never lie to the IRS. It just gets deeper if you do. Don't be afraid of using the words I don't recall. I'll have to check on that. Number three, try to get along with the auditor. Be polite even if it hurts. Remember the audit is, auditor is merely doing his or her job and didn't have anything to do with picking you. Remember no matter what tact the auditor takes, he, whatever tact the auditor takes, he is not your new best friend. If a new auditor appears on the scene, field audits commonly, commonly drag on for months or even years. Revenue agents may be replaced midstream. Sometimes this is a good thing for you, sometimes not so good. If the new auditor persists in traveling over old terrain, call in the audit manager. Tell them what's going on. You have the right to stand up to your auditor. When your auditor finishes examining one group of items, ask him if he's found any problems. If he says yes, insist that he spell out the facts or laws or what he's relying on before he proceeds to a new topic. If you forgot to bring something with you, not a problem. Reply that you need time to submit to it, and you'll bring it the next time you meet. Did you know you can negotiate with an auditor? A couple of common audit, audit issues you may be able to negotiate. Any missing documentation you have, as long as it's a small amount, not a lot of documentation. And if you know what the law is, any questionable legal uh, rulings that the IRS talks about. To end an office or field audit, You want to, first of all, as we said before, slow down the audit. Try to extend it. If the audit has not been finished within 28 months of when you filed your return, the auditor is going to ask you to sign a Form 872, which is a consent to extend the time, the time for them to access your tax records and go over them. This gives the IRS extra time to finish the audit. When you're asked to sign the, the consent reform report, you have three options. Sign it, don't sign it, or negotiate the terms of the extension. If you've got IRS problems at this time, feel free to call us to schedule a free 30-minute consultation with one of our people. We may very well be able to help you. There's a telephone number and also the uh, email address. Our next webinar will be next Thursday at noon, and we're going to talk about home office deductions. Now let me see how many questions we have here. Takes me a minute to get it opened up. And again this week I don't see any. I must be doing a good job or really a terrible job putting you to sleep. Okay, well, 
I do appreciate your being here today. If you've got any friends that you think would benefit from hearing this series, be sure and tell them about next week's uh, webinar. It'll be noon on Thursday going over home office deductions. Thanks again very much.